Well, I'm just traveling in Western Australia here and I am going along the south coast road from Albany where I was and I'm going to Esperance, Esperance uh, which is like 500k away. So I'm almost two-thirds of the way there. It's been interesting to drive through uh, on, this co on this road. It's got a lot of brush on either side. I'm going through an area right now, you look behind me. It's short brush, I wouldn't put it much more than seven feet. It's just scrub all over the place. And it's quite, uh, the, the, when you get to a field, it's huge. I just haven't really found a good spot to pull over to take a look. The farm I'm going to uh, will let me get some better footage of what it looks like in the area. Uh, but it's quite dry here. Every creek I've gone by or river is dry. I know they've been dry out here. In the background over here, uh, right over there, is uh, looks like some kind of refinery system. So uh, I don't know exactly where I am, uh, but it's been a pretty good drive so far. And uh, just wanted to stop and stretch my legs and kind of show you what it looks like. But it's scrubby I gotta go the flies bugging me I gotta go well I'm running I wouldn't I'm not running late but uh, I'm a little bit behind schedule but I wanted to stop and just show you what it kind of looks like out here I'm uh, just going past Esperance going out to the farm and it's it's pretty big fields I'll uh, get a better idea of what the fields are like. I think where I'm going, they're even bigger. Uh, but yeah, it's been a pretty good drive. A lot of scrub along the side of the road, so you can't see much past it, but uh, we'll have some good footage here, hopefully tomorrow when we do a tour of the farm. Um, and that's just from the rain over the last week that we've had. Right. And, and obviously, this, this was obviously cut to that height from the silage, but then quite a lot of it grew back back up and if you don't get too much rain there's still value in that yeah I mean it's probably lost a bit of its value now that we yeah. had um, now that we had that um, rain recently that's probably I mean I don't know if you're gonna see much now that yeah, it's dead but that's a pretty good amount of roots yeah yeah and it's really a lot of really really fine roots and I I mean I'm not a bloody <laughs> I don't get into too much. I'm a soil scientist. Yeah. And, and, but I think you need to have root material to drive microbial activity. Some, that's, the, that's the food. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, I, I, a lot of the biodynamic principles would say you've got to have cover and got to have green, green stuff growing all the time. And, and that doesn't really work in Australia in a dry environment. No. But, but um... You know, the best we can do is to make sure we've got systems that give you as much green, much root material in the, in the soil as, as possible. Now these clovers, they were part of what you seeded then, or...? Oh, or I, did, I did put a different variety in with the, clo with the ryegrass that grows up. There's, a, there's an underlying base of clover that's been here. So it's kind of a... Yeah, because it's it's a hard seeded clover that sets its seed under the surface of the soil. Mm -hmm. sub, we call it sub, subterranean clover. Yep. And the burrs would sit under the surface, like that's the clover oh, okay. bird, yep. and it's hard seeded. And so even though this will be canola this, this year and wheat next year, and it might be barley the year after that, the clover will still come back up yep. after that. Um, it just... And that's what drives most of our pasture is that subclover base, hmm. and it works well in a you know in a cropping rotation where it's yes, yeah. And you, so this is obviously so about maybe I don't know twenty five percent of our pastures we're actually going in and planting 
other, you know, planting new plants in there for the pasture phase. Yeah. But the rest of it, we don't have to. Hmm. And, and you could you could get away with not doing that, but you get a much more productive pasture if you put a bit more effort into it. Yeah. And the way you've kind of gone to grazing with your crops, you said you're able to crop a bit more land. Yeah, so carry the same number of stock and crop 20% more. Of the yeah. Stock. Whereas up the other end, it's less than one foot. How do you spread that uh, clay? I'll show you. I'll okay. we'll go to Chewel because sure. it is pretty interesting to see them doing that. It's hard work for the operators, they're sitting there. It's minimal to all the third and third. It's just kind of a lifting drop. Yeah. Tax policy. Yeah. Screwed up. Yeah. I'd love to see. And, and it had a really negative effect on our community, right? Like, yeah. Because there's been, it was probably in the order of um, 40 to 50,000 hectares of blue gums in the Esperance area. And like our little area, our little school of Pony Up, the numbers of people in the community just dropped because you suddenly had all these. What's the current state of green, the green industry in Western Australia? Well, we just had a very, very tough year for most people in the section of town. But those businesses in the, in the drier areas are very used to So is there uh, just uh, lime around the area or is it just fortunate enough to have a lime pit? We're fortunate, there's not much lime, like Russia still, yep. it's been screened once and needs to be crushed. You can see the, the pile. Yeah, it's kind of getting kicked out the side there. Yeah, so that's, that's getting just been screened and the pile, in the other side of it, it's just been pushed up with a bulldozer. So that's, mm. you can see it's got quite a lot of fines in amongst it. Huh. Quite interesting. 
interesting. So yeah, he's just dumping a load into the screener here. And yeah. Now, do you truck it or do trucks just come in and grab it? A um, bit of both, but the, the, we run our own trucks to cart our own and to some of the close neighbours. Yeah, so do they load load cells on the... Load cells on the, yeah, on the loader. On the tractors, yeah. So how many ton would be on that road train? Uh, 50. Silage here and yes. some barley. Kilo silage, kilo barley, and one of those And those are merinos. That'd be a merino cross. Okay, but. Yeah. We tend to have that, like, clear the black hole. Really, the caustic cider burns the, the outside of the wheat um, husk right off, mm -hmm. and and it stops acidosis because of the um, the buffering effect. So, you know, this gets hot. You put the water in. You put the bags of caustic in. The barley's in there, and you put water in, and it gets hot. You can hardly touch the side of the can. Oh, it really? It really reacts on that. And then you tip it out in the ground and let it um, cool off. And it's got a lot of moisture in it, but it's, you know, we sort of, we mix up, they might mix up four or five loads and then feed them out over the next few days. Mm -hmm. And then cool. the, the lupins are... Do you have to treat lupins at all? Oh, we just put them in holes. You can only have to flush them. But the yeah, the sheep are so good at... Yeah. That's the one thing people can't believe, you can feed sheep whole corn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And these are lupins. Yeah. And what would the protein? Oh, I think on lupins are um, 32% from memory. Yeah. Protein. And they just chew them up. Yep. And I really love them. I love the lupins. Huh. That's just. Uh, and it can, it can be barley or wheat. Yeah. Yep. It doesn't seem to make much difference. Yeah. Crazy. Pan type plow was a disc that was on a had a spring mechanism, so yeah, it's called a stump jump plow, so that it would pop over any of the big roots. Yeah, and he plowed it twice and root raked it twice, and then and the root rake's the same as that rake we saw down the blue gums. Okay, yeah, yep. and then he would plant it. So this is where the fire damaged the trees, and they weren't commercial for harvesting. They weren't viable. Yeah. How many tons you like be putting on? About 300 tons a hectare. And where do you source it from? Like, I'm you. sure. You just dig a hole. Just dig a hole. Yeah. 
we just finished bombing around the uh, very eastern part here in Western Australia down the bottom end of it the south end along the coast uh, quite interesting to see what they're dealing with here a lot of similar challenges around soil type uh, and the sand and non wetting soil so water that won't go into the soil and they're using clay to uh, fix the soil up and be able to make it wetting uh, to hold moisture and some nutrients uh, so that's some of that footage there and doing some drainage so that they don't have kind of big lakes of water out in their fields um, there's a lot of equipment here I'm trying to I'm uh, Andrew's been very uh, gracious with his time. I'm gonna hopefully hop out and take uh, some footage of some of the equipment around here uh, to give you an idea what he's got. But uh, he runs a number of acres, like a lot, a lot, a lot. Uh, so he's a busy guy and uh, got lots on the go. But uh, I'll, uh, I'll get some footage of the equipment here uh, a little bit later. So what we got here is a cedar. We call them an air cedar in Ontario. In Western Canada, in Australia, they call them cedars, I believe. But it's a morris uh, with the cart here. So you get fertilizer and seed up here and it blows it back to the disc here, or not the disc, uh, the cedar or where the openers are to put in the soil. And I'll show you that, but uh, they run forget how many he said uh, eight they run eight of these on the farm they run eight combines uh, or headers as they would call them tractors I, di I didn't ask them uh, I showed some footage there uh, and maybe I'll insert it here actually uh, that's a quad track a uh, case quad track uh, they had uh, that one that I took some footage of the other one you would have seen uh, running in the field was deep ripping and what they were doing with the deep ripping uh, is that they have really sandy soils but there's some clay down below underneath and uh, they got compaction issues so what they're trying to address is compaction so that deep ripping they were ripping half a meter uh, 50 I think 50 yeah half a meter and uh, when they do a half a meter uh, that would be a uh, foot and a half, so 18 inches, 18 inches deep. So uh, it's pulling pretty hard, uh, as you can see, and they got a feather it in a few spots, uh, but they're trying to get rid of compaction. And uh, it's just really interesting talking to Andrew here about what he does on his farm. And behind me too, I'll show you a little bit closer right there, is just a newer grain uh, facility handling system he put in uh, to dry grain uh, and I'll show you the dryer because it's a lot different than what our dryers are in Ontario But as you can see this is their cedar And much like Western Canada they run a Knife point and I'll try to get in there So this knife point basically goes through, opens up the soil, and then behind it blows in seed and fertilizer, and this is liquid fertilizer as well, or they could be running it for inoculant. Um, it's hard to say, I'd have to ask them. But yeah, so this basically opens up a trench. This blows the seed and fertilizer in, and then this is what kind of pushes it and firms it all down into place. So I'm not sure how many inches they run apart. Uh, my guess would be it looks like 12 inches so they're probably 12 12 inch spacing on their openers yeah that would be my guess uh, I don't know what that is in centimeters 30 30 centimeter over yeah something like that I'll put it in up here but uh, yeah so as I said they run uh, eight of these because they have to seed I think roughly 30,000 hectares in six weeks or in that six week period. So they're going full, full out. And I think they're running 12 meter, 12 meter cedars, which is roughly 40, 40 feet. 
Yeah, 40 foot. Uh, that seems to be their headers are all 40 foot. I'll go look at their combines. But yeah, their headers that they run the draper heads were 40 foot drapers. So yeah, that's their uh, cedar. Okay, this is a different kind of dryer. I believe it's like a conveyor dryer. So it's a perforated conveyor. The grain drops on it at the top up here and it goes along here and air is blowing up into it this way, pushing it through the, the perforated conveyor. And I think that's how it dries. It's got like a bed of grain that kind of gets conveyed along and warm air pushes up through it and it dries and then it drops down and probably gets uh, cooled in the bins here or it might be cooled in a certain portion of the dryer uh, I don't know for sure but uh, it's a, a bit of a different style than we have and uh, yeah it's quite big and then you have uh, these three grain tanks that he's using to uh, probably store some wet stuff in and actually store some dry stuff in later and they're what they call a sealed silo so they're airtight uh, because they don't have the cold weather we have in Canada we can freeze up our bins and it, it uh, basically kills any insects that we can get in our grain because they don't ever get that cold here they have to deal with storage bugs or insects in the stored grain and if they seal it and remove the oxygen from the system uh, then they can control uh, the the bad the pests that way so that's kind of why they have uh, these silos that are sealed and that's fairly common uh, from the farms that I visited in Australia so far that if anyone's kind of got a a, a bin like this uh, the most of them are usually uh, a sealed sealed system and this here is just kind of part of that system that shows you that it's sealed and it's part of their sealing system. Uh, the interesting thing here, they unload with motors. Run a PTO shaft, power takeoff, to drive an auger. And the auger goes here and loads out into trucks. So each bin has its own loadout, uh, as you can see down here. Uh, different, than we, with, different than what we do. Um, but yeah, it's pretty cool. So this is a relatively new setup he has here and uh, it's nice and tidy. In the corner there you got a couple big chaser bins, grain buggies as we would call them, Elmers running on tracks. Uh, they're on all control traffic here too where they tried to consistently drive in the same track all the time. And uh, so their combines are set up for that, the sprayers are set up for that, the tractors are set up for that. And it uh, just helps them, um, I think, from a compaction issue. But this is their other dryer that they tie into the system. So they run New Holland combines. And I've never really been around them. But the claim to fame for New Holland combines are their twin rotor, like a Kloss combine. But they do all the separation and the threshing and separation in the rotor where uh, Kloss Combine does a separation or the threshing at the front through a cylinder and then does a rotor at the back to separate it. So this does threshing and separation in two rotors. A lot of people speak highly of them in small grains. So if you can see behind me there is a number of combines. So they run eight New Holland combines the biggest that you can get from New Holland I believe um, some here as you can see have tracks and some have tires I don't know what the reason is but um, four of them have tracks and four have tires so anyways all the combines Pretty cool, pretty cool. You need a lot of combines when you're harvesting that many acres that they have to, so, and I think they're pushing it as it is with what they have, so. Uh, the one tractor that uh, 
I showed running the ripper in the ground, they put 2,000 hours a year on that tractor. 2,000 hours a year. So it's going almost all the time. Another thing they have a lot of is one, two, three, and there's a fourth one. And pardon me on the wind, but it's windy here. Uh, they have four self-propelled sprayers. I believe the boom spacing is 120 feet, uh, whatever meters that is, uh, to match up with their tram line system. Uh, but yeah, they're running these same one that you saw in a previous video, uh, a gold, gold acres sprayer that's made in Australia. Uh, I kind of got to see the guy. I didn't get, I didn't get to meet him, but I got to hear the the guy that. Uh, family owns a company here in Australia speak at a meeting I was at the other day seemed like a really nice guy really dedicated to the Australian ag industry and manufacturing industry uh, and just trying to create some opportunities for Australian employment and uh, produce a product that really fits well with Australian farmers these sprayers are really simple uh, the wheels aren't hydraulically driven it's all kind of chain driven uh, so they're cheaper to repair it's uh, a Cummins motor in it and an Allison transmission truck transmission so as I said they're pretty pretty simple to run pretty simple to fix and that's been a lot of the appeal for some of these Australian farmers and uh, it, from what I talked to and maybe it's just the people I've been around there seems to be more of them getting uh, picked up and purchased whether they're new or used so uh, yeah, it's uh, they got a few of these as well. These here they uh, fill with the chaser bins or the buggies on the edge of a field, and then they have a, a tractor or something hooked up to them that will uh, unload them into trucks for them to take it away. So these are kind of like temporary storage silos or bins they use uh, during harvest.